Today we're talking about the atomic keyword in C and how you can use it to protect your programs against race conditions, and also we'll discuss whether or not you should. Welcome back everybody to another programming video. Today I wanna to talk about threads. It's been a while since we talked about threads and concurrency and thread safety. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I do have videos that cover a lot of the basics about threads. And in those videos, you'll see me look at one way particularly that is using mutex locks to protect critical code that is not thread safe and help it uh, to be safe when used in multiple threads. Today I wanna to show you a different technique that some people definitely think is easier, simpler at least maybe, but I also think it has some caveats it has some tricky parts that I'm not sure I'm crazy about. So we're definitely gonna talk about that as well. Now, before I get into it, there's gonna be source code here. As always, source code is available through Patreon where you can get access to my monthly office hours. I also wanna mention some of you asked, you can buy this shirt if you really like it. And I do have an online course that deals with programming strategies if you are interested. And a huge thanks to all of you who support the channel in various ways. However you do it, thanks for being here and thanks for helping me do what I'm doing. But now back to threads, thread safety, and the atomic keyword in C. Let's Let's jump into the code. Okay, so today we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from an example that I used in my previous thread safety video, and uh, it's really simple. It's basically, it's got a thread function. We're using pthreads here, but this would work with any different threading library. I'm just gonna stick to pthreads though. So basically the idea is that I call cr pthread create to create two different threads. Each of them are going to run the code in thread func, and then I'm gonna call pthread join, so the main thread is just gonna wait for them to be done. And in these threads, we're gonna call this function count to big, and all that does is goes through and adds all of the numbers from zero to, what is this, 10 million? So we should end up with a big sum, and it should always be the same, right? And as I mentioned before, if this doesn't make any sense, I do have videos that, that talk about this, so we're sort of starting in the middle. Feel free to pause and go watch those videos first. I'll link down in the description to make them easier to find. But the main thing to look at here is if we're just starting here and I compile it. Oh, by the way, I do have a make file also. If you haven't seen those, uh, check out my make videos. They'll make that a little clearer. But once we have our code, you know, compiles, if I run it, then you're gonna notice, okay, I have a big number, that's great. But if I run it each time I get a different result, and that is because we have what's called a race condition. Now, in my previous video, we used mutex locks to protect against this. Because the issue is it's actually this code right here. You have this shared global variable counter, and that counter is a 64-bit integer, so it's multiple bytes. So you have opportunities there, multi-bytes. Some processors might update different bytes at different times. But also, this operation right here involves reading counter, incrementing counter, you know, adding i to it, and then writing it back. So it's actually, this is a compound operation. It has multiple different things that are happening. And it's possible if our threads interleave in a particular way, it's possible that one thread reads the value, then another thread reads the value, they both increment the value, and then they both write a different value and one of the increments gets clobbered. And so this is a race condition, basically, however these threads interleave, that determines what outcome we get. And so normally if I was using locks, if I was using locks, mutex locks, you know, same thing, I would come in here and I would call something like lock here, and then I would unlock once I am done doing this increment. And I would say that's the traditional way to solve this problem. But today I wanna to look at another way that we can solve this problem because maybe you think, okay, locks are a pain. People like to complain about locks. They're not necessarily bad or good. I mean, they're very useful, but one of the challenges with locks is you can forget to unlock a lock, right? So that can definitely get you into a little trouble if you grab a lock and then you don't remember to unlock it, then now nobody can get the lock. So anyway, the approach we're gonna look at today is the use of the atomic keyword in C. This is one of the newer keywords that have been added. I forget which standard version, but I'll uh, put it down here, yeah. But the idea with the atomic keyword is I should be able to come down here and say, I wanna make this atomic. So this is now an atomic uint64 underscore t called counter. And what this does is it tells the compiler that I want to treat operations on this variable as being atomic. Now let's look really quick what happens if I save it. We compile it. So it still compiles. That's fine. And now if we run it, but now you can see that we get the value that we expected. And if I run it over and over again, we are going to get the exact same thing. And if we come in here and I say, let's, let's time it 
Okay, so that was pretty fast. Now what's fast, what's slow? If we want a point of comparison, let's come in here and let's go back to my thread safety video. So this is the original version that actually used locks and it looks like I forgot to compile it. So let's go back here. Sorry about that, it's compiled now. So if we go time, thread safety, thread test, and we run it, we see we get the same result here, but it was significantly slower. If we run our version that uses Atomic, it's faster. Now what's going on? Well, it turns out that what's happening is that with the Atomic keyword here, what the compiler's doing is it's actually using Atomic operations that are built into the processor. It happens to know that there are Atomic operations. It knows that it can use my hardware architecture to give me Atomic behavior without using locks. And locks do incur some overhead. So in this case, the compiler is able to get this behavior without using locks. And so that saves us time so it speeds things up a bit. So that's nice. Now, of course, not all processors are going to have the same capabilities. And so in cases where I'm on a processor that doesn't have atomic operations in the hardware, well, it's basically the compiler is going to fall back to using locks. And so then we would get no speed up. It would be just the same. So using atomic here does not guarantee my program is going to be faster, but sometimes it does. Okay, now speaking of, of the fact that like different architectures have different capabilities, different compilers, one of the things that's really interesting and kind of annoying about this keyword is it is optional. Okay, not all compilers and not all platforms are required to support this keyword. And so if you are going to use this a lot, you may wanna be very careful because if you assume that this works and then it compiles on some architecture, some platform, use some compiler that doesn't support Atomic, well, hopefully it gives you an error or a warning, but maybe it won't and maybe it just won't work correctly. So if in this program, if we wanted to check before we did this, if we wanted to check to make sure that Atomic is supported, what we can do is, well, I'll just show you really quick. So you can come in here and you can basically just check to see the version of libc. Okay, so the standard C version. And I had to look up what this is, but it is, yeah, 2011-12L because it's long. And then, so we're gonna test to see if we're either earlier than this version or, or, we have this no atomics defined. So basically, if you're using an old version of the C standard or you happen to have it defined so that this platform or this compiler does not support atomics, so then we have a problem. So what we'll do is come in here and just test to see if that's equal to one. Then what we're gonna come in here and I'm just gonna say error help <clears throat> atomics not supported. And that should be a P. Okay, so this is a way, I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is a way to basically raise an error. So if you decide that you want something to give an error, a compiler error at compile time, well, this is one way to do it. And then we could stop here and we could just say, and if, and if you also wanted to do something where you actually check this, you could, you could do something like else and pound define has atomic, something like that. But for today, I just wanna throw an error if it doesn't work, so this should be good enough. Okay, so now this code will at least throw an error if I happen to be on a compiler platform whatever, that does not support Atomic. And let's just make sure this still compiles, great. But so that is one annoying thing about the Atomic keyword. Now, another thing that I wanna point out that I think is really kind of annoying about this is that using this Atomic keyword changes the behavior of this variable. It changes the semantics of how it behaves. And so I would recommend any time that you're doing this, anytime you make something Atomic, I would put Atomic in the name like this. Okay, so maybe we can come in here and just say rename symbol and make it atomic like that. And the idea here now is if somebody comes in and they're messing with my code, I mean, this is a pretty simple example, but let's just say that someone did come in and it was a bigger example. They can look at this and say, oh, atomic counter, this is probably atomic, right? The name tells you this is going to behave a little differently because otherwise someone could come in here and be like, oh, this isn't thread safe. And they come down here and start sticking locks into the code that doesn't need it because we're using atomic. So that's annoyance number two and just something to be cautious about. Now, annoyance number three is that you might uh, you need to be really careful here because let's say we take this right here, which works just fine. And what if we decided to instead say atomic counter equals atomic counter plus one plus I. Now, normally we would look at this and say these two lines of code are exactly the same, right? They're exactly the same, but are they? So what we're going to do, let's come down here and let's just compile it. Okay, so, oh, I forgot to save it. 
So we compile it and now we're gonna come down here and we're going to run it. And once again, we are now getting garbage results. We're getting, you know, incorrect counts. We're no longer atomic, okay? And that is because the compiler is not smart enough to take this and realize that this whole thing should actually be atomic. It just happens to know that this operator, this plus equals operator, as well as a bunch of other operators that I'll put in post along the side here, these operators read a value and update it. And so this should all be handled atomically. But it is not smart enough to look at your code and just infer that this right here should all be handled atomically. Okay, so don't do this. And so this is one reason why, in my opinion, in many cases, it's just more sane to use locks. Locks are more general. They're going to work in a wider range of cases. You do have to remember to grab locks and unlock them. If you don't, well, they don't do anything. But of course, I do have to admit that being able to add atomicity by simply just adding the keyword atomic before my variable declaration is really nice. And so use it if it's useful to you, but do be careful. Keep in mind those things that I mentioned, you know, things like it's not always supported, it is optional, things like it can get you into a little bit of trouble if you decide to do more complicated things. Do not assume that it's smart enough to figure that all out and make sure to document your code either through naming or some other mechanism to make sure the people who read your code understand what you're doing. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. I hope you learned something new, something that you didn't realize C could do for you. As always, please be careful with what you do with it. And until next week, I'll see you later.